at the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities and Casa Esperanza. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And we are going to begin our presentation, and we're going to record this presentation. So Maritza, you can go ahead and begin recording. So thanks everyone again, and the topic of our presentation today is violence against Latino women with disabilities and deaf women. And hopefully this will be a cultural perspective, and we're going to speak about um, many details around disabilities and violence and Latinas. And um, ideally, we want to have some discussion around the intersection of violence in the lives of Latino women. So at this point in time, I would like all of you to please take advantage of this forum and introduce yourselves using the chat uh, section. Some of you are already doing that. This is a way to let us know where you're calling from, what kind of work you do. And also, please, if you can, let us know if you are working at these intersections. If you have experience working with uh, individuals with disabilities and deaf individuals, this is a chance to do that. And I see that there is Veronica Clark from uh, Wisconsin, and she is a statewide coordinator of victim services for the deaf in that state. So welcome, and uh, that's wonderful that she also has experience uh, working at the intersections of Latinas and deaf women, et cetera. So this is also a presentation to hear from all of you. So if at any moment you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the chat, and I will try to answer your questions as much as possible. If we don't get the opportunity to cover everything today, then please don't hesitate to contact me later. You'll see my contact information at the end. So as I was saying, I'm the Training and Technical Assistance Coordinator at Casa Esperanza, the National Latino Network. Um, at this point, too, I want to remind all of you that if you haven't already joined the National Latino Network, to please do so. This is free, and it's an opportunity to receive information regularly about training, technical assistance, policy updates, etc., cetera, uh, related to uh, Latinos. So um, I'm going to go ahead and begin our presentation. And before I, I joined Casa Esperanza, I was a training specialist at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and I came to the Resource Center after doing advocacy work for uh, persons with disabilities and deaf individuals for about close to 10 years. So then I've had now the opportunity to uh, spend some time working and thinking about the intersections of violence in the lives of individuals with disabilities. And now I'm, I'm, I have the amazing uh, opportunity to um, take a look at those issues um, in the Latino community. So our goals for today is to, I would like to provide foundational information on disabilities and deaf culture identify specific aspects about violence experienced by women with disabilities and deaf women, also analyze the intersection of disability, violence, and Latinos in the U.S., discuss the obstacles faced by Latino survivors with disabilities and deaf survivors, and also discuss strategies for effectively responding to Latino survivors with disabilities and deaf survivors. So I just wanted to, before we move forward, uh, center ourselves around this idea that we're talking about human rights, and our discussion today is going to focus um, um, from this perspective of human rights. Um, so, and I borrowed this from a colleague of mine, Rosie Hidalgo, who is our policy director, and it's this slide that says that the future well-being of this nation is dependent on our ability to embrace diversity to build cross-cultural understanding, to help each individual to realize his or her own potential, and build a more just, nonviolent society that vigorously protects the human rights of all individuals. So I'm going to come from the perspective that domestic violence or violence against women is a violation of human rights. And having a disability or being part of a different cultural group that doesn't fit the norm doesn't excuse the violence or the inability to access services. So what is disability? Or what are we saying? What do we mean when we talk about disability? And I'm going to refer to the definition that is in the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And according to that definition, an individual is considered to have a disability if she or he has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, 
Also, if this person has a record of having such an impairment, or if the person is regarded as having such an impairment. Based on that definition, one in five Americans have a disability. That's very common, right? So here we can agree the variation in ability is common and is not special, and I'm using quotations to say special because I'm sure that many of you have heard uh, this terminology of persons with special needs, special ch children, etc. And within the disability rights framework, this is something that we like to avoid. And it's this idea of using special because it separates individuals even more, because it highlights the difference or um, this label of special um, kind of defines the person. Um, so we want to stay away from that and understand that based on that statistic that I just shared with you, and that comes from the census, we're talking about one in five Americans. We also know that disabilities could uh, affect us for some part of our lives. For many of us, it could happen all, during all of our lives. It could be a result of an accident. It could come and go. It could be as a result of aging, the natural aging process. So disability, and again, going with this definition, under this category of disability, which is a very wide umbrella, there are a couple of uh, distinctions. So there are developmental disabilities, and those are referred to the disabilities that are acquired at birth, that we are, or that we are born with. And in this case, we have cognitive or intellectual disabilities. And I wanted to pause for a moment and talk about intellectual disabilities, because uh, terminology as, or language in general evolves. And um, I wanted to highlight that we now utilize the term intellectual disabilities instead of mental retardation. This it was a victory from the disability rights movement also for individuals with developmental disabilities to, again, move away from that kind of terminology, terminology that is um, incredibly um, challenging and it really stigmatizes people. So intellectual disability is now the new term. Also physical disabilities, and those are uh, the disabilities that happen as a result of an accident, for example. So a spinal cord injury results in, in someone having to use a wheelchair, so that's a physical disability. Psychiatric disabilities, all of those that um, individuals have diagnosis based on um, the presence of a number of symptoms and usually diagnosed by a psychiatrist. For example, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, et cetera. And then the sensory disabilities. And as the term indicates, we're talking about um, disabilities related to the senses. So low vision or blind, being blind or being deaf, et cetera. So also to um, understand that there are disabilities that are hidden. Not all, we are not only talking about the visible disabilities, but it's important to remember that diagnosing a disability may label the individual. That, but that labels are there only as a way of accessing services that exist that are available for people. But that labels change over time, like the example I gave you a few minutes ago about intellectual disabilities. Also that labels may limit and stigmatize the person. So again, coming from the perspective of a disability rights advocate, it's really important that we understand this, that labels are there just as a way, as a way to access services, not to define who the person is. Going to the, uh, this idea that disability is very common, I think we all can agree that there are many disabilities that are age-related, for example, or that we typically see as adults age, and arthritis is one of them. Sometimes bad problems, heart disease, which could or could not be related to age, respiratory disease. These are very common causes or reasons for disability in adults. Again, going back to this issue with the label, to um, remember that diagnosis doesn't necessarily predict the individual experience. And this is really, really important when um, we are working at the intersections of violence um, against women that it's really critical that services, effective services, follow a culturally relevant approach 
So they are customized, they are flexible, they are, as we say, culturally relevant to meet the needs of the person that we are working with. And I wanted to pause on the deaf culture because I've been referring to persons with disabilities and deaf persons, and I've, I've been separating the two. And here uh, I'm using deaf with capital D because I want to uh, explain that deaf individuals with capital D um, don't consider themselves or don't identify themselves as part of the disability community or as having a disability. They consider themselves as members of a cultural and linguistic group, and they use the term uh, deaf with a capital D to reflect their cultural identification with this group. So again, I, t I always separate the two, persons with disabilities and deaf individuals, and we're talking about two separate groups, and yes, deaf individuals are protected under the ADA. But this group, this culture, this um, group of individuals uh, share a common language, and in this country in the U.S., we are referring to that as the American Sign Language. They share values and norms. They share a common history. So they really, really uh, consider themselves as being part of another culture, the deaf culture with capital D. So this group of advocates from the deaf community, also working very hard for their rights, uh, they coined this term autism. Autism, we know that the word in English doesn't exist, autism but it's an attitude that results in a negative stigma towards anyone that doesn't hear. And it's another ism like racism or sexism, autism judges and labels and limits individuals on the basis of whether the person hears and speaks. And I'm going to share with you some of the oddest attitudes that I think sometimes we have and sometimes we as hearing people may practice some of these things unintentionally. And one of the most common mistakes that hearing folks make is asking deaf individuals to read lips. And just to give you an idea, the ability to read lips is really a very unique and usually innate, so it's really born with the person, um, and folks have more or less ability. But even those who are considered to be good lip um, readers only capture about 30% of what's being said. So if you have the opportunity, try to do it yourself. Try to read somebody's lips. And as you can imagine, uh, if only you are able to capture 30% of what's being said, imagine the consequences in the context of violence against women. So again, try to refrain from asking ever a deaf person to read lips. Because that, again, is, is really um, it's a, it's a huge misconception, but one that's widely, um, it, it takes place all over, the, all over the map. And I think folks assume that uh, that's part of being deaf. Reading lips is, is just part of being deaf. So um, also assuming that the deaf person is unable to communicate with the outside world. So making phone calls for the person, assuming, oh, you know, they're deaf, they really can't do this. So I will call for them. That's a very oddest attitude. Deaf individuals are typically very savvy technologically. And they have, they use internet, they use now the video phones, they also the iPhone, for those that have access to that, the iPhone has video phone technology. So they usually are very, very aware of other ways to communicate with the outside world and with each other. So assuming that they are unable to do so, it really is um, an oddest attitude. Ignoring requests for accommodations. And this applies to when uh, we're working in local programs and someone um, comes for services, and of course if the person is deaf and everyone else in the program is hearing, so the person is going to request an interpreter. So deny this accommodation or say that we have budget constraints, we don't have the money, etc. It's another all this attitude and one that's actually illegal if programs are recipients of federal funds. Um, also implementing rules that exclude deaf individuals from participating. For example, if you have a support group in your program and the group of course is only um, for those who hear, there is no interpreter, um, and imagine if there is a deaf person in the shelter at the able to um, participate uh, in the support group. So that's another oddest attitude and one that excludes individuals from fully participating your program. 
there are also very specific challenges or issues that are unique to the deaf community, and some of them complicate um, the ability for uh, hearing or mainstream programs to advocate for deaf survivors if you are really unaware of this. So um, sometimes deaf individuals have limited access to information and education related to violence against women, and re this really depends on the community where they grew up in. There is also uh, the issue of deaf community members being very, very close to one another. So chances are that the survivor and the aggressor or the perpetrator uh, have common friends. So trying to access services or trying to move to another state or relocate could be very difficult for a deaf survivor. So these are things that are really important to know about. And the best way to advocate for deaf survivor is to collaborate with deaf organizations that are doing this work that could really uh, provide you with information and technical assistance about how to best um, support a deaf survivor in this process. And of course, as I was saying before, the lack of culturally relevant services for deaf individuals is one of the biggest challenges that the community faces when um, trying to um, um, you know, access services. So um, these are some of the things that some of these elements that we're talking about here are very common to, to other culturally specific communities. So um, and I'm, I'm seeing here now uh, that Veronica Clark is saying that uh, oh, they're having issues with, um, let me see this. Oh. Thank you, Veronica. She's just saying that the, uh, the information is useful, and well, thank you so much. And I think, again, as someone who works with deaf individuals, if you want to add anything, please do so. I really want to, um, this, and, and again, I'm, my presentation is from the point of view of the hearing person, so um, I'm not deaf. So I probably am going to miss some of the things, so, uh, and I don't work now directly with the deaf community. So feel free to add information if I'm missing anything here. So, but I was saying before I move into the next thing that some of these elements or challenges that we see when we're working with deaf survivors are also experienced by culturally specific communities. The lack of language access, the lack of culturally relevant services, all of those things are very common to communities that don't fit this mainstream traditional norm right, that we see. So let's for a moment focus on aspects that are unique to the violence experienced by women with disabilities and deaf women. So we know that the perpetrators of crimes against people with disabilities frequently know or have access to their victims through a personal or service relationship. And um, this is very common for those individuals that have physical disabilities who may need an attendant to provide assistance with daily living activity, such as you know, bathing or feeding or uh, the administration of medication, for example. So the person who is providing these services has a close relationship with the victim and um, makes this person very accessible to them. If we are faced with a perpetrator in this kind of setting, situations are very difficult here. So we know that when this person is that one providing uh, care, or, or if the person is an intimate partner, imagine how challenging it is to seek justice or help, right, for a survivor that's caught up in this situation that might need to maybe fire this attendant providing the care. And then uh, also realizing that attendants providing this, this kind of care provide very intimate functions, such as bathing someone, right? So imagine if you already established a relationship with someone, how difficult it is to start over with a stranger, you know, that have to come into your home and you have to again begin and train that person. So sometimes um, individuals with disabilities just decide, you know, I'm not going to do anything about this. I, you know, we'll, we'll get through this. But imagine how difficult, right, this would be for someone. We also know that reporting processes could be very intimidating, especially if we are working with someone who had had a negative experience with uh, mainstream services. Just imagine the court experience, for example, having to go to court, 
uh, in a system that's really centered around perpetrators. So we really have a system that has a lot of protections in place, such as you know, innocent until, until proven guilty, etc. There are good protections, but that make things very, very difficult for survivors. So if we are working with a survivor, and this situation happened when I was at my other job, this survivor, uh, working with a survivor who may have an intellectual disability, who could possibly have a difficult time uh, remembering time or details of a case and needs to testify. So typically what happens, they are considered not to be quote unquote credible um, witnesses. And that's all it takes for the case to be thrown out at the end, right? If uh, the person is, is not really, doesn't get the support necessary to tell her story or his story in court, that's all it takes. And all of you will receive a copy of the PowerPoint at the end of the presentation today. So do not worry, everyone is going to have a copy of this. The other challenge that we see with uh, survivors is that some may not understand that what they experienced was a crime. And this could go back to having the need to um, have support around um, around uh, personal care, et cetera. So having, having folks coming in and out, in and out of their lives, to perform very intimate functions, and then being taught to comply, to comply with other people. Um, sometimes it becomes the norm, and it's okay to accept that you're being abused, and really not know that what is happening to you is illegal, it should not be happening to you, and it becomes kind of like the norm. And um, uh, this person is saying that her experience is that the majority of deaf individuals that she's, she's um, encountered have learned to accept treatment that the rest of us would never accept or imagine, right? Things that would never happen to us. So this is tied to what I was just saying a few minutes ago. So we know, and this is based on a study that was uh, pu uh, published in 2009. It was a review of the literature the previous 10 years. So we know that compared to women without disabilities, women with disabilities are more likely to experience physical and sexual violence, increased severity of the violence, multiple forms of violence, and longer duration of the violence. And uh, you can access this study on VONET, which is the National Online Resource Center on Violence Against Women. And I have the link there so you, you can go and access this. So what does this tell us, right? We're talking about a group of individuals that we know is not uncommon that is at higher risk for violence. And notice that I'm saying risk and not vulnerability. And the reason why I'm, I'm speaking in terms of risk is because when we say that she or he is more vulnerable, we're placing the responsibility on the survivor. This happened to her because she's more vulnerable. So I'm, I want to send a message to all of you that we speak in terms of risk. So, um, so what are these elements or factors that contribute to risk? And we were talking a few seconds ago about this respect for authority or for those that are performing these very personal functions and very necessary ones, right? So is this respect for people in positions of power, but that's exactly what happens when we're in the face of a um, dynamic that's one of um, abuse. So we have that person there who is supposed to be there providing care and support and starts using that power to their benefit and they start abusing the person. So they immediately become someone in, in a position of authority with more power, so the person with a disability may be taught over the years to respect someone in a position of authority, and they are caught up in a very difficult situation. This also is related to the lack of autonomy because of needing care from folks that are there to provide the care. Again, if that's the perpetrator, imagine what happens. Situations are very difficult. Also that because of this need for care throughout their lives, sometimes children with disabilities that then grow up to be adults we're never taught about boundaries properly. So if this is related to many things. It has to do with cultural values, with this idea of, oh, she or he is a child, they really don't know better, so that's okay. It's okay to you know, kiss people with disabilities, kids when they're children, and that happens in all cultures. 
seeing a child with a disability, oh, she's so cute, and then coming over and kissing the kid and that special child, and really not respecting the fact that this is a person, that there are boundaries, and then it becomes, when these individuals grow up, what happens is that no one taught them boundaries. And then what happens, right? They become this very easy um, target for perpetrators. I was talking about teaching folks uh, to comply, and then unfortunately, the very common accessibility barriers that we know, survivors with disabilities experience when trying to access traditional services. So, um, so this person is making a very good point here, saying that she has experience with um, individuals that, whose cases were uh, dismissed because they were undocumented, and she feels that some of these things are, the, some of the scenarios that I'm describing are very similar to what she's saying. And yes, I uh, agree. And that's why I think this, in, this presentation today, I wanted to make that connection. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. Some of these um, situations that we see here are very common to um, undocumented survivors, undocumented survivors, Latino survivors. So I wanted to make all of these connections today. Very good point. Um, so we're going to focus a little bit with uh, some of the tactics used by perpetrators against someone with a disability. We've talked about some of them already. For example, controlling access to medical care, uh, controlling contact with the outside world. And this happens in many instances. It could be in the case of a deaf survivor who may, whose partner could be a hearing person and um, he or she uses the, what we call the hearing superiority to further isolate that survivor. And I'm going to pause now because I'm going to talk about specific issues um, related to deaf survivors. But that's one example. Also someone that may be responsible for driving the person to the doctor's appointment, to getting groceries, to um, meetings, to other things with the outside world. If this is a, an, a perpetrator, he or she may use that against the person. Also denying care, necessary care, like um, personal care, right? Uh, if they are there and they're there to provide support to someone with a disability, just denying this very necessary care um, becomes a tactic to control that person. Name calling, using remarks that are specific you know, to the person uh, with a disability, uh, making fun of someone because maybe they are not able to walk or speak uh, in traditional ways, et cetera. Also, threats to institutionalize someone. So especially if we're speaking about someone with a mental health um, disability or someone with a physical disability, um, threatening the person to institutionalize them. And see here that I'm using the term nursing facility and not nursing home. And I learned that from an advocate from the physical disabilities rights uh, movement who always said to me, nursing homes are not homes, they're facilities. We don't want to go to nursing homes. So um, that resonated with me because that's, that's part of this. You know, it's, it's a fighting against that threat of being institutionalized. And she was speaking from the point of view of a survivor who wanted to, um, to really make a, make a distinction between the home that she would choose, an accessible home where she could be independent, and a nursing facility. What other tactics? Well, removing, damaging, or sabotaging assistive devices. And this is very true for individuals that use assistive technology to communicate. Um, we know of someone who, um, what the perpetrators would do was take away their communication device, just put it away, so he couldn't communicate with anybody. And then they would say, oh, we don't know it's broken, we don't have any batteries, or oh, yeah, I'll put the batteries in later. So that was a very, um, very effective tactic against that person. Also checking histories on phones, on TTYs, on video phones, because usually there is a record of the call. So perpetrators, and many of you are probably familiar with this kind of, um, um, kind of tactics, right? When perpetrators really check computers, histories, and video phones, etc. Um, the use of restraints, not only physical restraints, but also medical. So over-medicate someone so that they could 
can't really uh, function. Also denying access to service animals or abusing the service animals for those individuals that need, need the service animals to function independently. And then attacks that result in disabilities. And I wanted briefly to talk about brain injury because it's a disability that we know a lot of domestic violence survivors um, have sustained and it's a disability that we rarely think about. We know that a lot of domestic violence survivors get hit over the head numerous times. And until very recently, um, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to these kind of disabilities. We know that someone with a brain injury uh, has changes in their behavior. And I worked with someone who, for example, she would forget to pick up her child from school. And this was something that the perpetrator would use against her in a custody a hearing, you know, uh, saying that she was an unfit parent because imagine that, she would forget to pick up her, her child. So folks with brain injuries, those are, those are one of the, the signs, or could be one of the signs of the brain injury. Forgetting things, not being able to follow through when there are a number of activities to perform in a day. So as domestic violence advocates, I think it's really important that we pay attention to this and that we think about what is the likelihood of someone that may be trying to access services or that you're working with right now. And sometimes I think um, it's sad and folks, you know, jump to conclusions and say she's not motivated, she doesn't want to work on her goals, et cetera, and it could be that she may be dealing with a brain injury. Um, also, what are some of the tactics that are um, unique used by perpetrators against deaf individuals. They may attack their ears to cause pain, hurt their hands to prevent, prevent the survivors from signing, also destroy or withhold communication devices, um, refuse to sign if they are in contact with um, someone, when I said before, if the partner is hearing and knows sign language but also is able to speak in traditional ways, so he or she may refuse to sign and then force the survivor to figure out a way to communicate and could be extremely stressful in that situation, imagine, right? Attack the person's sight to further isolate this individual. For someone, someone who um, is using sign language, typically uh, unless we're, we're talking about a deaf-blind individual, but for deaf individuals, they really rely heavily on, um, you know, on their sight. So imagine uh, hurting someone's sight to, um, to further isolate her or him, right? And so these are some of the tactics that are very unique and very effective uh, against deaf survivors. So I wanted to go over that a little bit to then move into, I know probably the, <laughs> the reason why you're on this webinar today, right? To talk about where we are, you know, within the context of violence against women, what do we know? about the intersection of disability, violence, and Latino survivors. And I think all of us, all of us on, the, on this call today and webinar can agree that we don't know a lot about this. And we do not because this is something that we haven't paid a lot of attention to. And it's something that at Casa Esperanza we are working hard to change and it's one of our, um, our plans, right? Uh, that we're going to really start being more intentional about looking at these intersections. And I invite all of you to do the same. But what do we know? And so I'm very glad about the person who made the comment earlier about the similarities between um, undocumented survivors and survivors with disabilities and Latino survivors, right? So what do we know about the barriers that Latino survivors with disabilities may experience just from the fact of being Latinas? They could be immigrants and also Knowing what we know at this point about disabilities, what could be some of these challenges? Limited English proficiency could be one of them. Immigration status. So we, we may be working with someone who is undocumented, and we know what has happened lately around uh, secure communities and other um, interventions that really have extreme uh, difficult and damaging effects on domestic violence survivors. Right? So what does that mean for someone who may be undocumented, who may not be able to speak English, who may also have a disability? 
probably their knowledge of existing resources may be limited, especially coming from another country, right? Not knowing what's available, what can I have access to. Um, also, and I really want to make a point here, um, existing attitudinal and programmatic barriers within mainstream programs, and I really want to talk about expectations that sometimes are placed on survivors, all survivors, but now within the context of being Latino survivors, some of the expectations that are placed on the survivors um, um, for, that contradict their cultural values and their norms. So what are some of these what are some of these things that what are some of the things that um, that we know that are cultural values within Latino communities? And I'm going to make a big generalization here. And before I move forward, I wanted to highlight the fact that Latinos are very diverse within the community. So I'm not saying that all Latinos are the same. However, there there's some values, some um, some things that I think are very common among Latinos for the most part. And is the, the value placed on family and community. So this idea that my family will take care of me, and also that, um, you know, is this emphasis placed on interconnection, which is different from some of the values that we see in the traditional mainstream American culture. There is a lot of emphasis placed on individuality and autonomy in American culture, right? So it's this idea that the family, when we're, talk about, we're talking about family, we're talking about the nuclear family. But when we're talking about families within the Latino context, we're talking about the extended family. We're not just talking about the parents and the children. We're talking about a much bigger circle that we're going to see in a moment. I have a little picture there. So this doesn't mean that individuals that are from this community are not independent or um, are incapable of making their own choices, but I think it's important to work within this context because sometimes it could be that survivors uh, may not want to leave the perpetrator. And this is not only unique of Latinos. I think we see this everywhere. But survivors may come to traditional programs for services or for respite not necessarily trying to make a decision that's going to change their future forever, such as leaving the family, such as relocating, and leaving behind their support system. So it's really important that we know which context we're working with. Um, so if we place into this the idea that maybe we're working with someone with a disability who may be in this country now with a family, chances are that we're going to see a family that's trying to take care of their own and trying to uh, protect each other. And I'm now talking within the Latino context. Jan Janine, I'm talking about the, la the, la the Latino context. Um, again, going back to this importance place on family. There's also the notion that persons with disabilities um, are asexual. And I think we see and we hear this a lot. And they are not necessarily thinking about you know, the future and getting married and moving on. And I think this happens in many families, in many cultures, and also true, could be within this context. Not everyone is the same, but unfortunately, I think we've seen this over and over again, that the family may come to this country and um, not know the resources, assuming that they're there to take care of their own, and then not, and, you know, doesn't, the families don't access some things that could be available to their children with disabilities or their adult children with disabilities, with this idea that we, you know, we are going to provide for her or him you know, for the rest of their lives. What are the challenges within this context is that um, parents are not there forever, is that um, there are many services available that individuals may never access because of lack of knowledge. And, um, it's just it causes the situation that we've also seen that when the parents age and are no longer able to take care of their adult child with disabilities, that the, the consequences are really negative on the person. They often end up institutionalized because there is no one to take care for, you know, of there to take care for of them. Uh, they don't have the skills because they were never taught, etc. So it's a, it's a very difficult scenario, right? So again, going back to this uh, context, cultural context, I uh, wanted to highlight again, and this was developed by Tapestry and our director of research, Julia Perilla, 
um, where we started to and I developed this uh, this um, I, I guess diagram or little uh, image that shows us. I, I love this because it really highlights this interconnection that I was talking about and the effect that every piece has in the individual's life. So when we are thinking about um, making changes or we want to um, propose uh, suggestions for the future, etc. Um, it's important that we take into, into account that we're not talking to the person by herself or by himself. So there are all of these elements, the, the effect that the in-laws may have in this family, the family of origin, the partner, the children. So we're not just talking, as I said before, about the nuclear family of the parents and the child. We're talking about this extended family, but then we're talking about the faith community. We're talking about the local community. And we've heard sometimes, you know, my family defines me. My community defines me. I'm part of this community. I'm a member of this community. Very important, this element of interconnection that so, is such a wonderful element when we think about utilizing natural resources rather than you know, criticizing or you know, taking advantage of this, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it speaks of the strength of Latino communities. It's a wonderful thing. And then it, it could also be a challenge, I think, when we are faced with situations of violence. It really depends on how, um, how it works, right? Which I think is also somewhat similar to what we were saying about the deaf community and how interconnected all, all of their members are. So I just wanted to share this, this piece with you. So what do we know about trauma? And let's think again about trauma in this context, in this context when um, we may be working with someone undocumented who went through a long journey to get here. And I had the opportunity and the tremendous honor to speak with a, a survivor from Guatemala, and she was just telling about her journey here, how she went through her country, to Mexico, through here, and by herself. So um, I was extremely humbled hearing her story and wondering about the impact that that journey had on her and, um, and the impact of um, all of that in her life. You know, so trauma, and we've heard the stories about coming through the border and all of that, and I think what we hear is just a little piece of what actually goes on, right? Although we've seen terrible and very um, accurate documentaries talking about the stories. But I, I couldn't believe that I was in the presence of someone who was willing to share her journey with me. And um, so made me think of all of this. What do we know of trauma? We know that it's very pervasive. We know that it could be extremely damaging on a number of levels. That can definitely complicate the recovery, recovery and, and healing process for anybody. That, but we also know there are ways to mitigate the effects of trauma, and we know that the way to, uh, to best deal with this is to really be what we say these days, trauma-informed, which, by the way, is not a new concept. Uh, culturally specific organizations have been doing this work for a very long time, and I would like to mention the work of a wonderful organization in Atlanta, Caminar Latino, that was founded by, again, Julia Perilla, that has done this work, um, has been very doing trauma-informed work for, from, the very, from the 90s. But now we are talking about trauma-informed, right? What does that mean? What does it mean to be trauma-informed? Um, what does that mean for Latino survivors? And here is what I heard and what I've seen we said some of the things that I, I know that work within our communities. And then I would say to all of you, although this slide says trauma-informed framework for Latino survivors, what works, I would say that this works for, as my, you know, one of our directors at Casa Esperanza, Amy Sanchez said, works for everybody, right? It's not, we're saying Latino survivors, but we're talking about all survivors. What works? Services that reflect the community. When I say that they reflect the community, I'm not talking just about hiring someone that's Latina to work because we know that we are working with a Latino community. It's not only demographically speaking. I'm talking about services that truly understand the needs of the community. 
So it, it's, it really isn't helpful to just hire someone because he or she meets the demographics. But may, maybe um, because of her values or education, et cetera, could really be more of a hindrance than a, than a positive thing. And sadly, we've seen this too. We've seen uh, individuals that meet the demographics but don't necessarily know or uh, understand the needs of the community, really want nothing to do with undocumented individuals, or um, are really caught up in titles and education, or other things, right? Work with a community that lives somewhere else and really don't understand or are part of the community. So again, when I say that reflect the community, that really, truly um, knows the community on a number of levels. That the services are developed in an active and true partnership between survivors and those providing the services. And that these services are informed by the survivors. Again, I'm not talking about disconnect between services and individuals saying you need A, B, and C, survivor, so comply. I'm talking about an, an active process in which survivors really um, design, guide the process, and are actively involved with every piece of the process. That, from the beginning, we are supportive of the development of leadership within communities. And this is something that I want you to all inquire if you're not familiar with. And Casa Esperanza has this leaders program that it does that, you know, or also the work of promotores, right? Promotoras and promotores that really work within the community with community leaders and the incredible effects, positive, very positive effects that this kind of approach has on everybody. As they say at Caminar Latino, walking with the survivor, not rescuing the survivor, right? Which I think unfortunately sometimes is an attitude that we see. And we see this a lot when we are working with individuals with disabilities. Again, going back to what I was saying earlier about expectations that we place on survivors. Sometimes expectations that we would not place on ourselves, which is really, really important that we take a look at what are some of the rules in programs and shelters? What are some of the things that you know, we are expecting of survivors to do? Would you do it? So these are the things that I, I really, you know, critically speaking, you know, what are we asking others to do? Would you do that? So again, think about also the concept of autism, of uh, this idea of looking at individuals with disabilities as less than, less capable, et cetera. Um, and I see someone is making the comment, speaking of less than, um, Janine is saying that she consistently runs into people who make the assumption that if you don't speak English, you must not be smart enough to understand. So this, I think, is a great comment because it applies to all kinds of things. If you, I would say that if you don't speak English, if you don't walk, um, if you, uh, I don't know, anything else that falls out of the norm, right? There are so many things that we can apply. And again, in this context, we're talking about the English language. But imagine, you know, if you don't have this or that ability that meets or fits within this norm, then you can't understand. You're incapable of making your own choices. You absolutely should not be in a relationship and even less be a, pro be a parent, right? So these are the things that are so ingrained in society that um, the, the job is big. <laughs> But I think uh, as advocates working at the intersections of violence against women, I think this is something that we have a responsibility to address. And sometimes it takes looking at our own selves and really come to terms with, well, I may be uncomfortable working with someone uh, with a mental health disability. What's that about? What is that about, right? And really get to the bottom of that because our attitudes really shape how we provide services and how we interact with everybody. Um, also, um, and this is a piece that I think I cannot say enough, and it's this little thing that I put here, listen, when I'm talking about listening, to really listen, to be present. When we're listening to someone tell us a story, uh, learn from that person. And I think overall, humility, I think it's critical in this process. And really looking at survivors from their strengths 
point of view. They are coming there. We have the opportunity and the incredible um, honor, you know, to sometimes be placed in these situations that we are just a vehicle to, we're just connectors, right? We are there to connect, to suggest, to listen, you know. So the choices, the, the decisions are up to that person, and they really are the true experts of their own lives. We really, what we learn in school, what we think we know, oftentimes these experiences don't apply when we're looking at all of these intersections. So what makes an organization accessible and welcoming? Right? What, what are the elements that make an organization accessible and welcoming? What does that mean? And uh, I continue to see comments here. Thank you all of you for posting your comments. Please keep doing that. Um, that this issue of seeing someone as less um, intelligent or less capable, uh, you've seen that in all different languages with all immigrant survivors. I've experienced that too because I have an accent, you know, when I speak. I sometimes get these looks like, oh, what? And I think it's because I have an accent. I think we, uh, depending on our experiences, I think we, um, we have uh, had some level, some degree of this, you know, at, at some point or another. So imagine uh, someone who really doesn't use traditional ways of communication. So what are some of the dimensions of accessibility that I'm thinking about and are critical in all of our programs and services to provide supports to all survivors, not just those that don't have disabilities, not only those that are white, or not only those that you know, can hear, so to, for everybody. And the dimensions are physical accessibility, and that's usually where people go when I ask if their programs are accessible. They say, oh, yes, we have a ramp. Well, yes, that's important. Physical access of a building, of course, is a very concrete, it's really important, uh, it's a very important element around accessibility. And sometimes we know that um, in this country we've seen that a lot of the shelters for domestic violence survivors are older homes that are, were adapted and converted into shelters. And it could be that sometimes it's not um, readily achievable, you know, when we're thinking um, of making modifications. Sometimes it's not possible to do them immediately. And sometimes modifications can be done um, in a very cheap way. Sometimes we think about this like, oh my gosh, that's such a huge process. We're going to have to rebuild, come up with an entirely new building. That oftentimes is not the case. And I think um, a suggestion around this is that all of you try to make connections with the Centers for Independent Living. And they're usually referred to as SEALs, Centers for Independent Living. And they are usually very happy to come into buildings and do an accessibility audit and give you suggestions, et cetera. Um, and yes, sometimes the issue with funding is a very tangible one. And when you have to make really serious um, alterations to the structure of buildings, sometimes it's not possible. But as I said earlier, we all have a responsibility, and what I think fails oftentimes is that when we're thinking about accessibility and accessible services, sadly we tie this to the availability of funds. And a lot of um, programs say, oh, we don't have the funds, and this is usually perceived as an additional task, a separate activity that we have to take on, and we will once we receive the funding. So. Um, I think that, again, going back to this as a human right and our responsibility as recipients of federal funds, you know, we, we do have, we have to come up with, pro with ways to um, make our programs accessible. But moving on from the physical access, it's also the programmatic um, element that has to do with accessibility. And this has to do with um, the way in which we provide services. So again, if you are accustomed to doing a support group that maybe lasts you know, a long time, um, maybe there is a survival, sur survivor with an intellectual disability, so you might need to modify how you run the group. So that has to do with the programmatic piece. Right? It's how you are delivering these services. I'm going to skip attitudinal and move to communication. And this is a dimension that we added because it's so, 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 you know, so common, right? Um, making sure there are uh, sign language interpreters available, making sure that there are other language interpreters available, right? So that 
communication access or um, what we're saying, um, the, the accessibility around communication is provided so that, that this is present in our programs. So this is a, a critical dimension here. So you may have a beautiful building, but you know, it could be that um, you know, you, you folks don't provide interpreters. So there you go. There is no accessibility for those individuals that have um, limited English proficiency if we are working in this context. Um, but I wanted to go back to attitudinal access because that's sadly usually the biggest challenges that I've seen. The, the biggest challenge, and I think this speaks to what I was saying before. What I was saying before about seeing um, accessibility as an additional or, or separate task from one from what we do every day. This is seen as a the special project. Going back to that word special, the special project. So folks thinking, oh, you know, we don't work with that population, which I've heard a lot too. Sadly, oh no, we don't work. She said she has a, a psychiatric disability. We don't work with those folks with those people. We don't work with that population. So this, again, speaks, um, speaks of the attitudes of individuals. And these are harder to change. This, are, this is like changing entire cultures. These are harder, harder to change than the um, structure of a building, right? So not all is lost. I think change is possible. But I think we have to be very, very critical and honest and really come to terms with our own, um, sadly, usually it's rooted in fear, you know, with our own fears around something that looks different from this so-called so norm, right? So what if we look at disability as another dimension of someone's identity? And an example here, again, going back to the deaf community, how the deaf community is looking at First of all, they don't consider to be individuals with disabilities. They um, are part of another culture. So what if, and it has happened in the independent living movement, there are some folks that spell the word disabled with capital D, and they do the same thing as deaf individuals do. The majority of folks when we're talking about disabilities, we like to use what we call um, people first language. So we talk about the person first. You can try it too. Instead of saying the disabled, we say the person with a disability or persons with disabilities. Uh, the mentally ill, that's very common. So we try to stay away from that and say he or she has a mental illness. It's not that she is mentally ill. She's a woman. She's a mother. Uh, she's a friend. And she has a mental illness. So the disability or this label um, doesn't define who the person is. So try to try to apply that to other things. Again, the exceptions are the deaf community and some individuals from the independent living movement that prefer to call disabled. And as with everything else, it's really uh, individualized. It really depends on how persons would like you to uh, refer to them as. And I think the best thing to do is just ask, right? But what if we move back to this idea of you know, having a disability is just another dimension of my identity. What if that's the case and we were to look at that in that manner, just as we look at, going back to the tapestry uh, picture, we have sexual orientation, we have uh, family of origin, we have, I think, language, culture, we have disability. It's another element of someone's identity. So looking at that, I think um, it kind of shifts our way of looking at disabilities. Um, and yes, Carla, I, we can talk about these labels later. So I could send you examples of using what I'm saying, uh, what I'm calling people's first language. All of you can look at this online. And this term was coined by Kathy Snow. But if you, you check people's first language, um, do Google it. Um, of course, the safest thing is to ask, as Janine is saying. But if you look at this, you would rarely offend someone if you say he or she has a disability. You know? So if we think about disability as a dimension of someone's identity, if it is determined by the person that it is that way, so it's part of the person. So when we're working with a survivor of violence, that hopefully we're not saying, oh, we can only address the domestic violence on the first floor. You have to go to the third floor for the sexual assault piece and to another place for this other part of you. 
So hopefully that we are really uh, holistic in our approach and that we see this as the whole person, which is again behind the whole theory of people first and culturally relevant services. We're looking at the whole individual with their family, with everything else that's relevant to them. Why is this important in our work? Because we're talking about access to all victims and survivors. We're not talking about only, I'm only uh, serving um, individuals that can hear, as I said earlier, those who are white, only heterosexual, only um, native English speakers. So hopefully, <laughs> We're not doing that. We want to serve and work with all survivors. That we are providing access. We're just there, as I said, as a connector or a vehicle to provide access to existing relevant services and resources. So why is this important? Because we have to know what's available. And going back to the Latina who may come to the program with a family that just came to this country, may have a physical disability, and um, the family might not know, you know, what's available to her. Maybe there is a lot available to her. So we are responsible for knowing what's out there. And I think um, it's unrealistic to assume that everyone knows everything about all services and about everything that's out there, but I think it's important that we partner with other organizations that work at the disability rights, you know, um, from that perspective that provide services to persons with disabilities, that work with the deaf community, because they can help us understand what's out there. So that when we're making a referral and we are working with a survivor, Latina survivor with a disability, we can say, you're here because you're experiencing violence and this is also what's available to you. So we're not just limiting um, our support to one little piece. We're talking, at the per you know, talking and working with the entire person. And also because it's our ethical responsibility to do so. As I said earlier, um, this situation or this commitment to accessibility is not just the right thing to do, it's not the thing to do with the next funding source or there is a special project that's going to give us the money to do it. We are responsible to provide services to all survivors, especially most local domestic violence, sexual assault programs, coalitions, as recipients of federal funds, and we have that responsibility. So how can we become allies and how can we provide culturally relevant services to Latinas with disabilities and deaf Latinas? How can we do this? As I was saying earlier, and you're doing it today, well, educate ourselves about disabilities and the needs of deaf or hard of hearing survivors. Learn and practice the use of assistive devices and technology. And I'm here talking about, I don't know, we've, We've seen in programs that, sad, and I'm, of course, I'm talking about the worst case scenarios today, which is not the norm everywhere or anything like that, or at least I hope so. But um, I've heard of situations that deaf survivors, for example, have tried to call a program through a, an interpreter using relay. And I've heard of situations that the programs hang up on them because they hear that there is an interpreter on the line and they don't know how to do that. It's a very simple process. It's as, it's as making a regular phone call. But it, it, might need, it might need you, if you're not used to this, to practice. You might need to practice. Every state has an entity that works at the state level with, with the deaf and hard of hearing community. And they typically go and provide training at no cost at an assistive technology, at no cost. And as you're saying here, yes, this kind of training, we need to be institutionalized so that it becomes part of the day-to-day -day training. I've seen a lot of programs that have TTY machines that are unplugged, and nobody knows how to use that. So I think, again, it's a very simple process, and organizations that work with the deaf communities are usually very happy to provide this training as well as a statewide organization that's there and usually that's for free with a statewide organization. So check your state websites, figure out who they are, reach out to them, and say that you, who you are and what you do, and you would like to receive training on the use of assistive technology for the deaf community. Also that you are partnering with communities, organizations, and agencies where people with disabilities congregate and receive services. That, for what I was stating earlier, there is where you can learn what's available 
and also establish those connections. So you can call and say, I'm working with someone who has a disability, I'm not sure, you know, what, what can I suggest here? And those relationships, once you establish them, I think you can count on these other agencies. Sometimes they're funding opportunities. There is the OVW Disability Grant Program that usually requires MOUs and partnerships between anti-violence organizations and disability rights organizations. Those are excellent opportunities to collaborate with someone who is doing that kind of work. And what comes out of that is usually amazing. You bring these two worlds together, and it's a constant learning from one another. So please pay attention to these and the opportunities that you may already have in your community. Um, also, it's important that you include statements about accessibility in your publications. So that you use the universal accessibility sign. It's usually the little wheelchair that we see. If your program is accessible, you make sure you include that on your website. So persons with disabilities can look at your website and say, oh, I can go there. That's a, that's a statement. And if you are printing brochures or booklets, that you have that also. So again, it's another sign, visible sign of your commitment to accessibility that you make connections with persons with disabilities, deaf individuals, and that within that community you are, you are identifying potential volunteers, new staff, board of directors members, so that you really are walking this walk. It's not just saying that, oh yeah, we, you know, we're accessible, but that your organization reflects that. The piece about being proactive, and this applies to the need for, again, providing language access in particular, and, and here is when I see a lot of, we don't have money to hire an interpreter. And interpreters, yes, they could be expensive, but the problem that I typically see is that organizations wait to the moment of the crisis to then figure out um, where to get the interpreter from is, as we all know, it's usually Friday night. So, um, and they never thought about this before. So it's usually the, um, what helps is to have a line item in the budget for accommodations. So you have that money set aside. And this is something that you get accustomed to doing. You know, you do this every time. Every time that you are writing a proposal, and which is great, you know, now there is all this emphasis at all levels around accessibility. So you can include that in your proposal. And when you develop a budget, you, you explain that. And this is for accommodation, and you have it there. Because again, it's the ethical thing to do. It's not just uh, tied to funding, right? It's something that as you would do for office supplies, and you do other things that no one forgets to ever include, accommodations is absolutely critical that we include there. And that we figure out who the interpreters are, so that you know them. And when you have a crisis, then you have an interpreter. Also, that you develop a process for reviewing your publications to maximize accessibility. What's typically recommended is that we use plain language when we're writing brochures and things that we want to put out there to reach the largest amount of people. So that you make sure you're going back and, and what you're writing is accessible to as many individuals as possible. Sometimes this isn't that simple. Sometimes we're talking about articles, scholarly articles, so maybe we can't go and change the articles, but maybe you need to write an abstract in plain language so people can figure out what it is that this article is about. So I think those are important things to do. Also that you're always aware of the cultural differences. I cannot say this enough, do not generalize. That's why I'm always so concerned when I say Latinos, so I, that's why the disclaimer earlier. There is tremendous diversity within Latino communities. Imagine people with disabilities within Latino communities. Be aware of the cultural differences. Do not assume anything. And then hopefully that you strive you know, towards this, this idea that all are welcome here, where you're providing services. And this poster was developed with funds from OVW, that uh, disability grant program that I was telling you about. And it was really trying to be as inclusive as possible. But that whoever would post this, again, this is another example of a visible commitment to accessibility. So think about it, you know, am I, is my organization accessible? Uh, are we really open to working with everybody? And that doesn't mean that, you know, you will achieve 100% accessibility. I believe that this is a long 
long-term process and one that requires true commitment and paying attention and always willing to make changes. But one of the ways to do it the most effective ways, again, is by partnering with disability organizations. They are the ones that have the expertise. Individuals with disabilities are the ones that can come in and tell you, you know, this isn't accessible because, and they can give you concrete ideas on how, you know, to make things work. I've seen situations of programs that have invested a lot of money remodeling. I saw a terrible, terrible example of a program that um, spent a lot of money um, working with someone and remodeled this whole bathroom and unfortunately was done by an individual that didn't really know uh, some of the accessibility standards. So that you, you know, again, they didn't go to the source that really had the expertise. So to avoid all of these things, and you're truly informed when you're making changes. So uh, this brings me to the end of the presentation, and here is my contact information. We still have about you know, a few more minutes for questions. So if you would like to um, ask any questions at this moment, um, we can, you know, I, can, I would do my best to answer your questions. But also, as I said earlier, um, all of you will receive a copy of the PowerPoint, but you can always contact me if you have any questions, if I can help you in any way uh, on this topic. The, the PowerPoint is going to be available, is that right? That's correct. Great. <laughs> <laughs> any questions at this point? And again, I want to thank everyone for your wonderful comments. It was very I, well done. Thank you so much. Any questions? I think I'd, I'd like uh, to. Go ahead. Uh, this is Veronica Clark from Wisconsin. Uh huh. And um, I just find the um, the challenge of the dual uh, the cultures, the bicultural uh, focus, bilingual situation, and the dual isolation that occurs because not only is the fam let's say we have a a Latina living with her uh, family from, from and and then those cultural norms and values are basically isolating her from getting the services here in this country that are available to her to be independent and it just seems like you can't get there from here uh, it, it's a hard thing to advocate for because you need to be culturally competent in both cultures. Exactly. And, Very well said. <laughs> right, and, and that's a tough one because even when you're culturally competent and, you, and you're understanding and learning, let's say you're partnering. I mean, I do a lot of partnering, partnershiping with a uh, domestic violence um, organization that supports Latinas, and we work together to understand each other's culture but you still can't just seem to get the services to the victim because of the barriers that the dual cultures put up. So I wondered if you had any comment on that. Yes, I think that, um, as you're saying, it's like a double. Um, yeah. Yes. So there is no easy formula here, unfortunately. So I think the best, one of the best things what you're doing is this co-advocacy strategy so that you're bringing um, a disability advocate and the person and then hopefully a Latino advocate. If, you, if we're talking about these two and somebody, I don't know if it was you who talked about a deaf Latina. Oh, and, that was, um, was that you? Yep. Yeah. So I think in this scenario, the co-advocacy approach is, um, is probably the the most useful approach in this context. A Latina advocate, because she'll be able to navigate some of the issues specific to Latino communities, again, is not the only answer because, as I said before, ideally you would need someone who understands the need of the community. So being Latina is not enough. We need someone who really understands and, you know, I'm from Cuba, for example, and um, I might not be very aware of, and this is the, same, the example of the lady that I had the, t the chance to talk to, she's Latina, but she doesn't speak Spanish. She's from an indigenous um, community, and so she speaks an indigenous language, right? So the fact that I'm Latina doesn't mean that I understand all the nuances of the community. So ideally, you would have a team approach 
with a deaf advocate, the person, and that Latina advocate, so that everyone could work as a team here and learn from one another. I mean, this is not a formula, like I said earlier, this is the way to do it, that's it. You know, I think um, everyone working together, but it's po probably your best bet in this situation, not just one individual, because yes, you're, you're navigating through two cultures. And then a third one, which is the service provision element, yeah. because we're functioning in this context of this country, right? Yes, yes. So, that's what I would suggest, the co-advocacy approach of your doing, and then bring um, a Latina advocate too. So, and, yeah. yeah, thank you, that, because that is what, how we've been handling it. So I just, you know, I didn't know if you had any magic. <laughs> but thank you. I am sorry, no magic tricks. <laughs> and, um, and then, like I, like I said to you, you know, this doesn't guarantee success, but again, um, make sure that, um, this idea of the success is defined by the, in this case, the deaf survivor, right? Because sometimes what we think is success is not what the deaf survivor wants. So in this whole process, the, this is a team approach with the deaf survivor in the center of this, kind of guiding and informing everyone in the process. So is it easy? Absolutely not. But it's one of those, um, I think, wonderful challenges. Because if you are able to establish that kind of relationship with, across cultures, I think that's amazing. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? I, just, okay. I was just going to say, it's, I've enjoyed seeing, this is Janine, I've enjoyed you know, reading everybody else's comments and stuff, and it's kind of nice to know that everybody else out there is doing the same kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. And again, please uh, contact us anytime. Um, contact us anytime you have any questions. Uh, if there's anything that Casa Esperanza can do to support your work. Uh, again, working with Latino communities and across cultures in, in the sense of you know, also reaching out to the disabilities community. And this is something that I can help with um, because of my previous um, work. So I have some contacts across the country with, with uh, disability rights advocates, with deaf advocates. So I think we can all do this together. It's really the only way to do this. So Carla is asking about certificates for participation. We usually do not provide certificates, but if um, what we could do, if this is acceptable from VOCA, we could probably do a letter saying that you participated in this webinar for this much time. So. Email me if you, if you think that, that would be helpful, Carla. Any other questions at this point? So thank you all so much. I think this, you have been a wonderful uh, audience. And, and, um, and again, for those of you who want that letter, please email me because I'm not going to have a chance to see this um, as we exit from the webinar. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. So do, please do not forget to fill out the evaluation when you exit out of the webinar. Evaluations are our best way to learn from all of you if our presentations are relevant, if we are helping you, if we are providing any new things to your work. So please take a few moments and fill out the evaluation. Okay? Well, thank you all so much, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you for thank participating you. today. Thank you. Thank you.